Coming up on Tech News Today, Amazon gives you free music that you already paid for. We'll explain. Tim Cook pleads with China Mobile and Nokia on the rise again. All that and more coming up. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Thursday, January 10th, 2013. Tech News Today is brought to you by Squarespace, the fast and easy way to create a high-quality website, blog, or online portfolio. For a free trial and 10% off your first purchase on new accounts, go to squarespace.com and use offer code TNT1. And they recently launched a developer platform for complete code control. And by Pond5, the world's stock media marketplace. If you're a media maker looking for video, photos, illustrations, music, sound effects, after effects templates, or 3D models, check out Pond5. And for an exclusive 50 free stock media files, go to pond5.com slash TNT. And by Landtronics, maker of the XPrint server. Print from your iPad, iPhone, or any iOS device to virtually any printer. For more information, visit xprintserver.com slash twit and enter the code twit to receive free shipping on your order. Welcome to Tech News Today. I'm Tom Merritt, still not in my new permanent studio space. I'm Sarah Lane in my permanent space. <laughs> I'm Maya Zaktar in my hotel room in Las Vegas. And I'm Jason Howell. And this is the show <laughs> where we keep you up to date on the most important stories Running in the tech world. Running a tight world. ship. Put a context for you on the tightest ship in the tech universe. <laughs> Start with the top 10 stories. We're back to 10 now in the news views. Amazon introduced a new service today called Auto Rip. Michael Robertson probably thinks this sounds familiar. Uh, it gives customers who buy CDs a free copy of the album in MP3s added to Amazon's cloud player. Not only that, but any CD you bought under that Amazon account going all the way back to 1998 can qualify for Auto Rip. More than 50,000 albums are already in the program, including most new releases. Amazon has all major labels and most indie labels on board and will continue to add albums from their back catalog to Auto Rip over the next few months. Google chairman Eric Schmidt has called on North Korea to end its ban on internet access after visiting the country with former uh, New Mexico Governor Bill Richardson. Schmidt told reporters at the Beijing airport on his way back home, quote, as the world becomes increasingly connected, their decision to be virtually isolated is very much going to affect their physical world. The government has to do something. If they have to make it possible for people use to use the internet, which the government in North Korea has not yet done, it is time now for them to start or they will remain behind. Investors are happy with Nokia today because the company beat expectations in its last quarter according to preliminary financial information. Nokia's devices and services business generated 3.9 billion euros in the quarter, which is down from last year's 6 billion euros. Nokia also sold 4.4 million Lumia phones, while its budget auction line sold 9.3 million units. Apple CEO Tim Cook did happen to drop by China Mobile to see Chairman Xi Guaha in Beijing Thursday. Pardon your, my pronunciation there. Uh, China Mobile representative said the two company chiefs discussed, quote, matters of cooperation. Sesame Street would be so proud. China Mobile, with 700 million subscribers, is the world's largest mobile carrier and does not yet carry the iPhone. So I'm betting they talked about that, too. Verizon, AT&T, and T-Mobile USA will embrace RIM. And executives at each company have gone on record saying that they're looking forward to BlackBerry 10 devices. In fact, Lowell McAdam, chief executive of Verizon Communications, says, we're hopeful it's going to be a good device. Sounds really promising. BlackBerry 10 is on track to launch new smartphones later this month. That's high praise. We're hopeful. Yeah. Okay. California's Attorney General released a set of privacy recommendations for app developers. The AG said the aim of the recommendations is to protect privacy while not stifling innovation. The guidelines try to help developers keep track of privacy issues when an app is being developed and also how to disclose its privacy practices. 
Apple announced Wednesday that screenshots that go along with app descriptions will now be locked in place once the app has been approved in the App Store. New screenshots will only be allowed when the app is updated. Uh, the rule is meant to prevent fraud, where some unscrupulous developers would get an app approved, then swap the screenshots to make it look like a different, more popular app. The FCC is opening up what it calls a substantial amount of radio spectrum for the use of Wi-Fi, which should improve the speed of wireless devices and ease up what FCC Chairman Julius Janikowski calls a Wi-Fi traffic jam. 195 megahertz of new spectrum will be opened, all in the 5 gigahertz band. Opening up more spectrum could especially help in crowded places like public Wi-Fi access points, airports, that sort of thing. Samsung left the truly bizarre keynote stunts to Qualcomm this year uh, and showed off a flexible display instead called Yum? Yum? It's Y-O-U-M. The display was demonstrated on a prototype Windows phone. Microsoft also helped show off a new projector that would project images into the entire room in which you're playing a game, on an Xbox, of course, uh, to provide a more immersive experience. But it was Samsung's keynote, not Microsoft's, after all. Uh, and the Samsung also showed off another bendable screen that folds over the edges of a phone, uh, a phone that unfolded into a tablet, a 28 nanometer, eight core Exynos 6 Octa chip, and finished with President Clinton. That's not a joke. President Clinton was there. Okay, a couple yeah, of was, days he was, ago. He gave the last thing. Uh, probably buried in all the CS information. A couple of days ago, Dell introduced Project Ophelia, which is a device a little larger than a USB memory stick, and it turns a television or a monitor into a cloud-based computer. Now, the device itself runs Android 4.0, but will allow access to remote PCs or virtualized PCs. Project Ophelia has, also has integrated Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, so if you want to connect to it, you can do it wirelessly. This episode of Tech News Today brought to you by our good friends at Squarespace.com. I use it for my book site, MeritBooks.Squarespace.com, uh, and it makes it look like I know what I'm doing, like, like I can actually design a website, and I cannot. But it could do the same thing for you. Even if you can design a website, you can tweak the, the CSS, the underlying HTML. Uh, they use all the latest uh, code, all the latest versions of CESS. They use HTML5 in there. But you don't have to get in there and, and do the code. The, the brilliance is they have these mobile responsive templates that are not only beautiful, but also adapt to the screen that someone's looking at your website on. So you upload one image, they resize it in seven different versions. They have a template that, that works on different versions. So if somebody's looking at your site on a phone, it looks like it was designed for that screen. They're looking at it on a tablet, looks like it was designed for that screen. Desktop, laptop, same thing. And Squarespace is reliable. Their uptime is legendary after they kept everything up uh, during Hurricane Sandy. So if you don't want to be messing with servers and reboots and getting messages from your host saying, oh, you're over your bandwidth limit now. You might, you're going to have to reboot. We're, you're, we're not going to do anything for you. You have to get rid of all that. Get squarespace.com. Try it out for free. You don't have to give them a credit card or anything. You can just take it for a spin. If you like what you see after the trial period, use the code TNT1 and get 10% off your first purchase on new accounts. Whether you sign up for a monthly plan or an annual plan, you're going to get 10% off that first purchase. That's squarespace.com. Use that offer code TNT1. Everything you need to create an exceptional website. And we give Squarespace big thanks for the continuing support of Tech News Today. All right, let's start off uh, talking about Amazon's auto rip service. Uh, this is the uh, the service where you buy a CD, uh, and the, and they have almost all the new CDs and some in the back catalog. They're adding new CDs all the time. You'll see a little auto rip logo when you buy it, and if you if you buy a CD that has auto rip, they'll automatically add the MP3s from the songs on that album to your Amazon Cloud Player. And if you don't have Amazon Cloud Player, it doesn't matter. They'll they'll put it in your account anyway, and they'll, they'll help you set it up. Uh, you never have had to have signed up for Cloud Player to get this. And, and the best part is, all the way back to 1998, CD any CDs you bought that they have a record under that account, going back to 98, they will give you MP3s. No extra charge in your Amazon Cloud Player. And you can download those MP3s. They're, they're, they're actually like 256, I think. Uh, they're decent MP3s. This is launching only in the U.S., but they do plan to uh, bring it out later this year in the U.K., France, Germany, Italy, Spain, and Japan. So it's coming elsewhere in the world. Uh, I, I don't know. Did you guys get this? I had four albums uh, show up today. Thanks to Auto Rip. Sadly, by 1998, I was pretty deep into Napster territory, <laughs> so I wasn't really buying anything. 
Well, yeah, Napster came along, what, like middle of 99? So, yeah. I mean, I well, what was it? Was 98 still when I was uh, when I was still buying CDs? Because I, you I remember I, I graduated from college last half half that year. some CDs in there, sure. Yeah, yeah. I haven't gotten Unless to test the news yet. groups. I, I, I didn't buy a whole lot of CDs from Amazon, apparently, or at least I didn't buy them under this account. I think I had multiple accounts. What about you, I guess? I haven't tried it out yet, but like I, I think this is a, a really fun move from Amazon because I'm, I'm, there's an episode of Know How coming up where we're talking about how to clean up your music library. And this is the kind of thing that happened. Like you'd have these old CDs, you'd rip them way back when. And if iTunes didn't rip it, you didn't have the right metadata. And this is just making it a lot, it's a lot cleaner because I know I want to re-rip all my CDs. But if I bought them on Amazon, I'm kind of kicking myself. I wish I had done that. Bought the stuff on Amazon so they would show up automatically. It's just, it's a really good way to get people into the Amazon cloud system. If you weren't into that already, you're like, hey, look, my music's already there. It's one less step to getting your data up there. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's a good differentiator between it and Google Music and iTunes Match. Now, you said you hadn't tried it out yet, but they send you an email that says, hey, you bought these CDs in the past 12, 14 years. We've added them to Cloud Play for you. So you didn't get an email like that, huh? Uh, it's possible. I just, I, you just I've haven't seen it yet. Tons of emails, um, so I'm not. Uh, I, I didn't. I didn't get that. I think the thing that that really uh, gets me about this is I remember on Buzz Out Loud at CNET when I was working there covering MP3 tunes from Michael Robertson, which did the same thing that his original MP3.com did, which was buy a CD and get the MP3s right away. Uh, I, and I think I actually bought one CD through that just to try it out, and. They got crushed. The label said, no, we want nothing to do with this. The difference is Michael Robertson just went and did it, said, hey, I've got the fair use right to do this. People can rip CDs. I'm just ripping them for them and keeping them in a locker. And Amazon went and struck deals with all the labels many years down the road when they're realizing, oh, we really need something to help boost CD sales a little bit as it wanes. Uh, what, do you, what do you guys think is the reason that the labels would change their mind and agree to do this? It's not like they're trying to save CDs. Or, or is it isn't just it? to I mean, help the transition along, get people used to MP3s who aren't used to it yet? It could be to help CD sales. I mean, they are sitting around. They are they do exist. So even if, if Auto Rip applied to an old stock of CDs that are just sitting around gathering dust, if you can get them moving, I mean, that helps. And, and the other thing is people might be, become used to the idea of buying DVDs or movies and having a digital copy with it. Instead of having to go with this concept of, okay, I get the disc, I got to rip it myself and figure out how to make this work. It makes everything a little easier. So I guess maybe even it's Amazon appealing to those who still buy CDs. The music industry, just they're much more mature at this point. If they can make more money, why not do it? Yeah, I, I never want to buy a CD again. Um, they take up space and they're heavy when you put enough of them in a box. Uh, but I do love, I love the ret retroactive aspect of this. I mean, 1998, that's a long time ago. Um, if you had 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 purchased a lot of things, and especially even as gifts, somebody in yeah, that's what I was wondering. In chat was like, well, what you know? It's like you you actually, as long as you spent the money, you can sort of even enjoy music that maybe you had never enjoyed before. <laughs> so there's there's some nostalgia aspect to it. I think I think this is pretty cool. Yeah, it's cool. I, I certainly isn't going to make me buy a CD. No, uh, but I'll be curious to see what other CDs that hadn't been added to Auto Rip start showing up. Uh, over the next couple of months as they fill out the back catalog. Let's uh, move on to Tim Cook. John Pachowski from All Things Do. Uh, we mentioned earlier this week, speculated that maybe Cook would want to go meet with China Mobile and their 700 million subscriber base to try to get the iPhone into that carrier in China. Uh, that, and that's what what's happening, right, Sarah? Yeah, exactly. Uh, China Mobile, of course, it's the mainland China's largest of the three wireless providers, has over 700 million subscribers. So that's a huge market that happens to not yet carry the iPhone or the iPad. Uh, Reuters is reporting uh, that that Tim Cook, Apple CEO, met with uh, the the China China Mobile uh, chairman uh, Ki Gua Hia. Oh gosh, I'm, yeah. that's not mm -hmm. gonna. Yeah. That's probably not how you say it. At uh, at China Mobile's headquarters in Beijing uh, to discuss <laughs> what a China Mobile spokesperson called matters of cooperation. They have they had signed a confidentiality agreement, so. There's really not much more to say, but we do know that they are in talks. And of course, Tim Cook is, you know, he's kind of the supply chain guy. He's good at this. So it is it's certainly something that seems promising. Um, talks between Apple and China Mobile 
have apparently been going on for a long time. It's not as if Apple just now realizes that China Mobile would be a really, really good carrier uh, to have as a partner. Uh, but there are some revenue sharing terms, say analysts, uh, that, that, that both of the companies haven't come to an agreement on. Although Cook wasn't just there uh, for China Mobile. On Tuesday, he met with China's Minister for Industry and Information Technology. On Wednesday, he met with executives at China Unicom, uh, where Apple already has a relationship. So he was making the most of his trip. Uh, he also uh, uh, told Asina Technology News that Apple has 11 stores in China and they're going to continue to expand. We'd like the number of retail uh, stores uh, to exceed 25. So it's on the up and up. You know, yesterday uh, we talked a little bit about uh, the idea of a cheaper iPhone and is this somehow part of this trip? You know, is, is, is Apple trying to figure out how to get into a lower cost uh, smartphone market, which is which is very, very healthy in China right now. Phil Schiller spoke to the Shanghai Evening News yesterday, and the next web is verified this is this is an official interview. And listen, he didn't say well, we'd never do something that, like this. But he says, at first, non-smartphones were popular in the Chinese market. Now cheap smartphones are more popular, and non-smartphones are out. Despite the popularity of cheap smartphones, this will never be the future of Apple's products. In fact, although Apple's market share of smartphones is just about 20%, we own the 75% of that profit. So it, it sounds like Apple's like, listen, uh, you know, we've got some Digitimes rumors, we've got some Wall Street Journal rumors. We're not working on a cheaper smartphone because that's not what we do. I think that this is more about Apple trying to get China Mobile to take the iPhone, the the actual iPhone, the iPhone five, right? Uh, and and China Mobile has so much leverage. They're they're not in the position that most mobile carriers are, where they say like, hey, you know, we really need the iPhone. You know, Sprint going to to Apple and agreeing to what many people report are are some pretty egregious terms uh, in order to get the iPhone. China Mobile's got the leverage here. China Mobile's telling Apple. We're going to have the egregious terms. You're going to agree to something that we want. Uh, and so that's why the CEO has to travel all the way over there, kowtow a little bit, uh, and, and make a personal relationship to try to work that out. Uh, I don't know that that doesn't mean that they won't come out with a cheaper iPhone. And if they did, it wouldn't go to China Mobile. But I don't feel like that's at the center of this negotiation necessarily. Yeah, I think that they, they, they want those users, 700 million users. Uh, if a small fraction of them ended up buying iPhone 5s, Apple would be really happy. I mean, the fact is Apple is, I mean, they're, they're on the other two carriers of the, of the top three in China. They need to get into that number one position. That is such a huge subscriber base that they could reach. Even if they just get a small portion of that, that's going to help all kinds of quarterly numbers and annual numbers. Because Samsung is everywhere. They are just basically taking over when it comes to smartphone sales. And if, if Apple doesn't get onto China's number one mobile network, then they're going to just constantly be stuck behind and watching their lead diminish worldwide because China is a very important market and it'd be foolish to not try to play by China Mobile's rules because like Tom was saying, I mean, Apple's been, they've had the, the opportunity to push around wireless companies, but in this case, they can't. Yeah, and I mean, Apple isn't even number two in China. Samsung's number one, but then we got Lenovo, CoolPad, ZTE, and Huawei all with, with more market share in China than Apple. That's actually fallen. Uh, Apple was at one point in fourth place. Now it's at sixth. China's a very important market. And yeah, it's, it sounds like Apple's just uh, being as aggressive as they can be. Now, speaking of watching your lead diminish throughout the world, uh, Nokia has been doing that for quite a while. But they just uh, released some numbers for Q4 that, that seem to be turning that tide, huh? Yeah, because okay, so Nokia released some preliminary numbers, and uh, they're better than expectations. That's the big news. It's it's not as bad as as as, as analysts thought it would be. Uh, Nokia has sold 86.3 million phones, uh, devices and services. Like I said, they generated 3.9 billion euros, but that's part of a trend of declining uh, revenue. Now, last year in quarter four, they generated 6 billion euros. In quarter four of 2010, that was 8.5 billion euros. So they're not making a lot of money, but they are selling a lot of Lumias. 4.4 million of those sold. Asha sold 9.3. That means 72 million of the phones that they sold were the Series 40 phones. And there's a couple of uh, Symbian phones still in there somewhere. Stephen Elop said he was very pleased, saying the company managed its costs efficiently. Tom, does it look like this is the beginning of Nokia turning it around, or does that 
does that diminishing revenue per year kind of frighten you? Uh, okay, this is a result of Stephen Elop being a competent manager, I think. Uh, he has cut costs, we, you know, and, and that, that always takes a lot longer to show up in the balance sheet than people really expect. You have the layoffs, and a year later you see the benefit because you have to pay out and adapt and all of that sort of thing. Uh, and and I, I think the fact that we're seeing a lot of Asha sales and a lot of Series 40 sales still making up large percentages here uh, means that no, Nokia is still riding the coattails of its previous reputation as, as a maker of commodity phones. What I'm not seeing here is a big guarantee that the Lumia is going to start bringing in the bucks. And that that's what needs to happen to turn that revenue number around. It's not bad news for the Lumia. Don't get me wrong. Uh, it, it's it's needed news uh, for the Lumia. So so no, this is this is overall good news for Nokia, but they're certainly not off the burning oil platform yet. Maybe they've put out the fire. I can't remember exactly what his metaphor was. Uh, Sarah, you know, like, like uh, Tom was saying, Stephen Elop has been cutting lots of different things from Nokia, making it much more streamlined, trying to figure out how to make the company very viable. Does, does it look like that putting all their, their eggs in the Windows world, is that the best bet for them? Now I'm using weird metaphors. Too. So many eggs in the Windows world. <laughs> ah! <And title>. <laughs> <laughs> They're everywhere. It's so good. Uh, I, I, I mean, the, the, the revenue dropping extremely sharply, I mean, that's, that's just a reality of it. Yeah, I mean, you can streamline a company, you can cut as many costs as possible, you can lay off people, you can close plants. That's all, that's all stuff that Nokia has done over the last year. So yes, you can become a more efficiently run company, but sales are sales. There's, there's just less of it happening. Um, so I think that this is a really good, oh, I don't know, five-year plan. Uh, and, and maybe that's even optimistic, but it, it, it's the, the trend isn't going in the right direction. I yeah, mean, all of the non-Windows phone things seem to be working, but they really need the smartphone thing to work. Now, the other thing is, I mean, if you start comparing the numbers, you know, in, in a vacuum, 4.4 million Lumia sounds great, but I think the S3 sold 15 million units last uh, last quarter and that's down from a sale of 18 million units so they've been doing very well at samsung i mean obviously with android although i'm very curious if nokia just would have been a also ran if they had gone with an android operating system because if they went with migo or they went with whatever they were going to use instead of windows phone i don't know if they would be as successful as they are i do think this is a long-term bet and they're hoping microsoft's going to keep them afloat yeah it, i i this made me question my prediction from our prediction show that Nokia, you know, would be either up for sale or sold by the end of this year, uh, because this is the kind of thing that will keep them out of those troubled waters. Uh, but we'll see how Q1 of 2013 does. Uh, hopefully, for Nokia's sake, it it continues this trend upward rather than this just sort of being a leveling out. Let's take a quick break and uh, thank our sponsor, Pond5, the world's stock media marketplace. Uh, I know a lot of people in our audience make videos. They make podcasts. They they make books. Uh, and they need stock media. If you're if you're you can't afford a helicopter, most of you can't. Maybe you, okay, you that one guy who's really rich out there, but the rest of you can't afford a helicopter. But you can get a helicopter shot of Shanghai, of Singapore, of London. Uh, all that kind of stuff for your for your video. Make it look like you're traveling all over the world. Get shots of wild animals, all kinds of stuff at reasonable rates, royalty-free, so that you can use them legally, but you don't have to keep paying out, keep paying out to use them. Pond5 gives you an instant access to a vast selection of stock media. They've got the world's largest collection of royalty-free video, more than a million clips, uh, plus more than 10 million professional quality vector illustrations, photos, music tracks, sound effects, customizable motion graphic templates, 3D models, all that kind of stuff that you need when you're editing together a great program. And it's great if you make content as well and you want to sell it. If you're like, actually, I did go to Singapore because I'm the rich guy you were talking about, Tom, and I would like to get richer. Well, sell your video on 
Pond 5. It's great for artists. Uh, they're shaking up the traditional stock agency business with an open artist-friendly marketplace for professional content. Uh, they give you control over the pricing and pay out 50% royalties for each and every sale. As a result, the prices are unbeatable. So is the range of quality and content available. And you can try it out with 50 free stock media files. Go to pond5.com slash TNT right now, and you can get those 50 free files just to see a sample of what they've got at Pond5. That's P-O-N-D-5, the number 5, P-O-N-D, the number 5, dot com slash T-N-T. And we thank Pond5 for their support of Tech News Today. On to Samsung, uh, issue, <laughs> announcing a new phone that really isn't all that new. Yes. Yeah, so, so th okay, this, this headline got me confused. I, I, I had to look at it a bunch of times. This is what I want to talk about on today's show. Uh, Samsung is releasing a new phone, but it's an old phone. It's the Galaxy S2 Plus. That's not, that's not a typo in my notes. It's the S2 Plus. It's, <laughs> it's pretty much the same hardware as the S2, uh, but there's going to be an NFC option, less onboard storage. There's 8 gigabytes, and that's the only model as far as we know. Supports micro SD cards up to 64 gigabytes. Uh, the original S2 only supported up to 32, but it had a different configuration when it came to storage. Software is a bigger difference because the original S2 ran gingerbread when it came out. This is going to run Android 4.1.2, I believe, uh, which is Jelly Bean. It comes with S3-like features like a pop-up video player, you know, the multiple window style thing. It launches in Germany before being rolled out to other markets with no pricing. Now, this has been rumored for a while, actually, it turned out. SamMobile.com had a report back in August 2012 that Samsung will launch the S2 Plus for about 300 to 400 euros. So that may or may not be the price. You know, Jason, I, I, I want to maybe address this question to you. Can you make any sense of why there's a Galaxy S2 Plus when there's a Galaxy S3 Mini? The only thing now, mind you, I was up all night with a kid with an ear infection, so I didn't read this story before the show, so my apologies. But the only thing that I can think of, it kind of ties in to what we've been talking about when it comes to an iPhone, right? You've got an iPhone 5. And then you've got the older models of the iPhones that they still sell. They're less expensive, but they're an entry into that kind of that what what they offer. Right. Same thing could be said for this here, although it's it's really strange when you start saying, oh, now we're releasing a new phone that's based on a previous model. Um, it gets even more confusing, you know, just in the sheer fact that Android as it as a whole can be kind of confusing just with the sheer volume of devices so having an s2 and an s3 at the same time might be a little confusing but maybe it's a way to kind of bring people into the samsung world that maybe don't want to spend 300 dollars on a new phone uh, depending on which is, carrier the weird thing is the s2 plus kind of beats the mini the s3 mini in specs it's got a larger screen it's got the same resolution uh it's 4.3 inch screen compared to four inch on the mini it's got a faster processor at 1.2 gigahertz compared to one gigahertz uh, it's got a better camera eight megapixels on the on the rear facing camera instead of five uh, Sarah, what, what do you think of Samsung's approach? I mean, they're, they're flat out making like every single possible variant of a phone. Well, meanwhile, Nokia, RIM, and Apple are all like, look, we're making one or two phones, and that's pretty much the way it's going to go. Samsung seems successful with this model. Well, they are successful. <laughs> I mean, Absolutely. Samsung is killing it right now. I do think that the naming is just strange. Um, I'm trying to make sense of why you would want to confuse consumers because... It, if, if people are familiar enough with Galaxy S2, Galaxy S3, okay, I, I understand what the S2 Plus is, is going for. That's fine. I think a lot of people, though, would say, oh, the 2, that's just an older phone. Uh, so that, I want the better one. I want the 3. Um, it, but it's plus. But, but, but that doesn't, what is that? <laughs> yeah, I know, Galaxy totally. No, I, I'm that kidding. sounds to me, if, you know, if, if I hadn't read the story, it would be like, oh, that was like a souped up version of that phone from, you know, from from the last round, yeah. But but we've got Which a three, so, so that's like. better anyway. Yeah. I don't know. What? Are, hmm, I don't know. <laughs> I, I I I don't really get it. But I think that Samsung will probably sell a lot of them. Um, Samsung is doing really well, and you know they just sort of like throw everything at the wall, see what sticks, and enough people really like uh, the products so that they're they're selling a lot of phones. Tom, are you any less confused than the rest of us why this product exists? Not really, no. I mean, I have my own theories, but it, it is sort of confusing. My my best guess is that Samsung realizes that the the Samsung Galaxy S3 is still too pricey. I mean, and we don't have price information, right? Right. But this has got to be cheaper, otherwise it doesn't make any damn sense at all. Uh, but S3 is still too expensive for some people, and yet they those some of those people may not want the smaller screen uh, of the Mini. 
so mm -hmm. they're like, you know, the Galaxy S2 is still really popular. People really love that phone. Let's update it. Instead of retiring it, uh, let's let's bump the specs up a little bit, throw a plus name on it, and and still keep selling it. So I, I guess my my feeling is they're trying to ride what has been a strong market uh, for a particular brand all the way to the end. It kind of reminds me of when Sony comes out with the PlayStation Slim or, you know, yeah. like they at near the end of their console's life, they, they start to adjust the form factor, maybe bump a couple of specs just to extend the life of that brand for a few more years. You know, a couple of people in chat are saying, well, what about the iPhone 4 versus the 4S? Isn't this sort of similar? The 4S didn't come out after the iPhone 5 was already out, though. Mm -hmm. That's the that's the issue that I'm having. It's not yeah. as if putting a plus on something is confusing in its own. It's that number. You go three and then you go back to two. I, I don't really I don't really get the thinking there. It would be more like if if uh, Apple came out with the iPhone 4S plus right now. Exactly. Yeah. What if they just had a, a ton of like stock of uh, of you know components for the S2, and they're the like, how do we get Galaxy rid of S2 this cases. without totally eating it? <laughs> they're like, we're out of chips, but we still have the plastic case. Exactly. Put something else in there. <laughs> uh, speaking of confusing, Polaroid coming out with a tablet yes. that runs Jelly Bean. A couple of them actually. Yeah, this is uh, Polaroid's big announcement at CES. Two new Android tablets. Uh, that, you know, they're going to go head-to-head -head with all the other Android tablets out there. Uh, the M7 is a 7-inch tablet. It'll retail for $130. It's got a dual-core processor, 8 gigs of internal storage. Uh, both of these tablets actually have a 1280 by 800 pixel IPS display, 2 megapixel front-facing camera, micro SD slot, is running Jelly Bean. The M10 is the 10-inch version. It'll retail for $230, has a quad-core uh, processor, 16 gigs of storage, HDMI, uh, 5 megapixel rear camera, both tablets on uh, a tap to be released uh, this spring. And <sighs> I just, I'm sort of like, all right, what? I, I'm trying to make sort of sense of this. We've heard, back in December, we heard that Polaroid was, uh, would, would, would be coming out with an Android powered camera. That makes sense to me, and that actually I think is kind of exciting. Um, back in uh, December, Boy Genius Report had some at least tentative specs uh, that the camera would have an 18.1 megapixel sensor, 3.5 inch touch touch screen, you know, HDMI run running Android 4, uh, you know, so you'd have things like Wi-Fi capabilities, photo editing app capabilities right on your camera. That's exciting to me, you know, because you've got a good lens and and possibly um, lenses that can be interchanged. But Polaroid making a tablet that is like, okay, well, the prices are somewhat attractive, but nothing else in these specs seems interesting or different at all. And look at that display. Like, what is going on there? It looks like Windows those, tiles. Check out those Windows 8 tablets. What? I mean, that those are, wait a minute. What is <laughs> happening here? Like, nothing about that looks like Polaroid to me. It's yeah. very confusing. It, I, I, does anyone well, Lucera, think... You're forgetting, you're forgetting that you have to shake the tablet to turn it on. Oh, and gosh, the yes. the screen slowly re resolves. <laughs> Over 10 seconds. You know, I'd laugh, except that everybody in the comment section of this article on Boy Genius Report made that same joke about well, four hours ago. It's a legally required joke. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's, it's uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, does anyone think that Polaroid is going to be successful with Android tablets? I think it could be a compliment to their cameras, actually. I mean, if you're going to, let's say you're making, you're taking a bunch of Polaroid pictures and you're like, okay, I've got it on, on my camera and I want to watch, look at them on a larger screen. If there happens to be, and if you're actually satisfied with Polaroid's quality of, of uh, products, you might go to Polaroid's uh I guess they're, they're tablets. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of concerned about the pricing. If the pricing is so low cost, I'm kind of con I'm concerned about what they skimped on. And if it's that capacitive touchscreen, I've, I haven't gotten to play with this, uh, this tablet yet. I might go try it today. But if, if they skimp on that capacitive touchscreen, it's going to be a nightmare of a user experience. So I don't know if they'll be successful at it uh, unless they can figure out how to go ecosystem, ecosystem, ecosystem. Remember, Polaroid emerged from bankruptcy, reformed, mm -hmm. I don't know, five years ago or so. Uh, so they're, they're, the company is still trying to figure out what they are. They don't make instant cameras anymore. Or film. Uh, and I guess this is Do just one. Do they even one, make film anymore? One, what's that? Do they even make film anymore either? I believe they someone one makes the film, but I'm not yeah. sure that it's Polaroid. Yeah, I, I don't think Polaroid, uh, they, yeah, they, they, they handed that off uh, to, to, to some other company. 
I've always liked Polaroid. I, you know, it, what was it last year or two years ago when Lady Gaga became the like creative manager for Polaroid or something, and that was a big deal at CES. And you know, it's 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 kind of it's kind of fun to see Polaroid innovating, I guess. But I I don't know. I I don't uh, I don't expect much from Polaroid tablets. The impossible project at the former Polaroid production plant in the Netherlands makes vintage Polaroid camera film now. Hmm. There you go. So there you go. It's expensive, I bet. Let's uh, let's finish up with a, a tale of copyright woe. Uh, and what I think is probably going to be a signal event uh, in the copyright discussion relating to the internet this year. Jonathan McIntosh uh, is the guy who created the Buffy versus Edward Twilight remixed video. Uh, do, have you guys seen this video where he intercut Buffy scenes with Edward scenes from Twilight and it kind of has a narrative where she's complaining about him stalking her? Yeah. I have not seen it. It's, it's pretty funny, but it's also a commentary on these types of movies and the romances uh, that they that they that they display and in his opinion promote uh, he pointedly does not try to make money off of this that is important to this tale okay it also meets fair use criteria uh it is transformative because he's he's intercut two different uh movies to, or television show to movie uh he, the amount of use is okay uh it's commentary and it doesn't affect the marketplace for either of the properties now the register of copyrights office the copyright, the part of the copyright office that is charged with with issuing recommendations for DMCA exemptions, has used this video as an example of why fair use deserves an exemption from the DMCA. So it is held up as an example of fair use by the U.S. Copyright Office itself. On October 9th, YouTube's content ID system flagged it as violating copyright of Lionsgate, which owns the Twilight intellectual property. Left it up, though, with ads. So they didn't take it down, but they had ads on it. And, and Macintosh is like, I don't, want, I don't want ads for anything, especially Nordstrom, which I guess is the first ad that started showing on it. So November 26th, over a, almost two months later, he finally got the claim released for the audiovisual content. But immediately, Lionsgate put in a claim for the visual content because you can put a claim against audio, against visual, or against both. It took him until December 18th, so a little less than a month, uh, for his appeal this time to be rejected. And Lionsgate deleted the video and a strike was placed against his YouTube account. He had to go to copyright school, which is this YouTube video, to get his account unlocked. Uh, and then on December 20th, after he had sent an email, Movie Clips, which is the agency that Lionsgate uses to police this sort of thing, said that they had the, uh, the video removed because Macintosh refused to allow them to run ads on it. And so they had no choice but to delete it and put a strike against his account. So Macintosh has now filed an official counter notice, uh, which gives Lionsgate 14 days to either allow the video to be reinstated or to take him to court. That's the way the DMCA works. Uh, New Media Rights, newmediarights.org, has been offering him legal assistance throughout this. Th is this the, the way the system should work to encourage fair use and creative uh, remixes that are 100% legal? Well, clearly I mean, the answer is no. I mean, virtually no question. And 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 YouTube has become a bit of a star chamber here. You're presumed guilty. He's got double jeopardy. He appealed once, got it reinstated, and got it taken. Got the same exact. He's being tried twice for the same crime here, right? I don't think it's double jeopardy because that couldn't happen. But um, uh, okay, so it's like was, double jeopardy. Yes, it's like. Uh, where do I start on this one? So uh, there. There's copyright infringement when when this fellow took that that visual and put it together in something. Fair use is a defense to all of this. It's it's an, or an excuse out of it. It gets you out of that. So the thing is, is this work a part of fair use? It likely is, and that's and, and it's been used as an example. It it has a lot of a pedigree, as it were, when it comes to how this is an actual work that is within the the safety of fair use. Uh, YouTube is just regular. I mean, they seem to be pretty trigger happy just because they've been burned for years when it came to copyright infringement notices from Viacom and a whole bunch of other companies. They, they at this point, they seem more interested in being a a house of 
professionally, professionally produced content. They want to have movie deals in their Google Play Store. They want it in YouTube rentals, and they don't want to do anything to offend these giant content partners. Meanwhile, they're just completely crushing people that are doing things that are completely legal like this guy did. Now, whether this means that people need to move away from YouTube and they can go to Vimeo or they can move to Dailymotion or, or some other site, it's just – Unfortunately, the way YouTube is working right now is just not friendly to somebody who, in theory, I guess is testing the bounds of law. I don't think this guy is testing the bounds of this at all, by the way. I think that this work is transformative. It is fair use, but it hasn't been tried, right? So he doesn't actually – it's not technically been judged to be fair use. Yeah, that's a problem with the law, with the way the law is right now. Uh, and, and as you rightly point out, and I should disclose in this particular instance that my wife works for YouTube, but I don't know anything special about this case. Uh, I do think that it shows how the YouTube process does not work to protect fair use in any way. Uh, it, it definitely provides an avenue, but from October until January, it takes to fight your fair use claim. That's not right. There has been one court case where the judge did say that fair use should be considered by a company before they put a DMCA claim. So there is possibly some sort of remedy down the road if you wanted to pursue it to say, hey, you've unfairly accused me and I need damages for that. Uh, but this, I think this is going to be a beacon because this isn't new. Lots of, lots of people have run into this, but I think it's such a clear case of fair use uh, and it and it's such a it, it shows off the arcane process that we have put in place for people who are following the law. Uh, hopefully, somebody like Senator Wyden or or somebody who who can actually uh, get some momentum going will use this to say, "Look, you know what? We need to reform copyright law. It's just way overdone now." Well, see, the thing is, is this an issue of copyright law or is this the way that YouTube is handling it? Because the thing is, there are other ex exemptions to the DMCA that were published by the Library, Library of Congress, and I believe some of those things would be okay. Some of the, the things that the, a Macintosh did would be all right under some of these ex uh, exemptions. It just right. no, it doesn't but, seem like but, the laws is causing the issues. So the people are using the law as a club. But what is happening at YouTube is a result of what companies come in and and pressure other companies to do. So certainly, you could go to Daily Motion, you could go to Vimeo. If we don't change the law, the companies are going to come in and pressure them to, to do a similar uh, situation. I mean, what YouTube is doing is following the letter of the DMCA, saying, look, fair use is a defense. We're not going to be judges of fair use, and we're not going to judge the claims of someone else. We're going to follow the DMCA to the letter. Uh, so could YouTube be a little more reasonable about this? Certainly. Uh, there, there's room for them to improve the system. But it's the law that's causing this system, in my opinion, to happen. But see, like, like, look, YouTube could be stronger for the content companies, not companies, the content makers like Macintosh. I mean, Twitter has fought warrants and things, subpoenas. They fight right, against but, but Twitter's data. not following, it's not the DMCA. The DMCA well, yes. gives YouTube 100% protection as long as they don't get involved. As soon as they go, ah, I don't think we're going to take that down because it's fair use, they're involved under the DMCA. What they have to do to preserve their safe harbor status is not dispute that kind of stuff and say, I'm going to believe whatever anybody is telling me. I think they should be willing to fight. They need to fight harder. But Yeah. We'll see. Uh, I, I, I don't think they can uh, under the law, but there you go. Let's move on to the randomizer and robots. Randomizer. Robotex Avatar is made by a company called Robotex that generally specializes in making robots that are military grade, uh, that, that, you know, go and do bomb sniffing and stuff like that, SWAT busts, radiation level monitoring. But they've come out with a $299 robot uh, for your home or office. It's a little blue tank that you can plug your phone into, Android or iOS by USB, and then do remote monitoring. Uh, so you can follow your pets around at home. It could be a little security system. Uh, and they're going to make the SDK and the HDK available so people can come up with their own innovation, innovative uses for it. Wait, but your phone has to be docked in the robot? Uh, a phone has okay, to be docked. Okay, so maybe an older phone or something. Yeah. Kind of fun. I think my cats would love this. Well, maybe they'd be really afraid of it. So I'd, you could I'd still like to give it a go. Yeah. If, you had, if you had them on FaceTime or something, you could watch your cats like run away from this. I know my dogs would be trying to attack this thing. Uh, it, it, it's, I mean, this is what people were doing with Roombas, actually. You could, there was an SDK for those, and you could, you could make a telepresence robot effectively out of it. This is just – this is kind of nuts. I kind of love this idea that this is where we're getting at, where, where military technology ends up being in your home as a, as a – I don't know, a cat chaser? 
if I don't figure out this whole LA studio thing, I think this is my next chance. Are you just going to... We'll gonna just commute? have a little robot version of me in the Twit studio. <laughs> <laughs> You'll just be wandering around getting coffee yeah. on this uh, little blue robot. Just, you'll just roll the robot up to the desk when it's time to do the show. <laughs> You're going to need a gas lift or something to get up there. Yeah. <laughs> it, I, I'd love to know how, how, how snappy it is. Can it go up and down stairs? You know? Yeah, can, it's can it turn corners? It looks a little clunky. Yeah. But hey, it's a robot that for follows a cat. Right. Exactly. Dogs <laughs> What's are not to <laughs> like? Give, take my $300. Take it. Don't All right, let's it. take a, a quick break and thank uh, Lantronics for their support of Tech News Today, the makers of the X-Print server, uh, enabling wireless printing from your iPad, your iPhone, or your iPod Touch, eliminating the need to print through apps. You can install soft... You don't have, you, Actually, you don't have to install software. You don't have to email yourself documents for printing. It works with the USB or network printer you already owned, whether it's wire or wireless. In fact, it can make your wired printers into network printers. Uh, you, you go, you print from the iOS native menu. I, I was stunned how easy it is to set up and how quickly it works. Supports more than 4,000 top brand network printers, automatic discovery and setup of the printers. And then you just open it up and you select print from any app that, that can print and, and you're printing. You're on your way. You don't have to put in a special app or anything. Home Edition is $99 and supports up to eight USB and two network printers, more than you'll need of most houses, uh, seriously. Office Edition is $199, supports up to eight USB and an unlimited number of network printers. And like I said, it allows your USB printers to be shared with other users on the network. So go investigate xprintserver.com slash twit for more information. And if you'd like to buy it, that's where you go as well. We've got a special offer. Use the code twit and get free shipping on your order. Remember, visit xprintserver.com slash twit, and at checkout, enter that code twit for free shipping. We thank Lantronics for their support of Tech News Today. What's on the calendar? Any, anything much today, sir? Well, you know, there's something happening in May, and that thing happening is 14 new episodes of Arrested Development, which Netflix has confirmed. I actually, um, even though I, I, I'm still happy that this is happening, it's just been so long that... I'm I'm excited, but I've had such a break of of Arrested Development that I, I'm excited. I don't know. Am I, when you see, when I've you moved see the, on. I guess you see the new episodes badge on your on your Apple TV on that, on Arrested Development. You will get excited again because yeah, something is new I think, again. I think you're right. I, I feel like we'll May May feels far right now, but it's just around the corner. Yeah. So you're going to be Netflix. you're going to be singing a different tune in May. All right, fine. I, feel, I feel kind of the same way. It's just, it's, it's not that I, I, I'm, I'm happy about this. It's just a lot of time has passed and the world has kept spinning. All right. <laughs> it's, it has it? Do yes, it does. Is that what it's doing? I think. Is that why I'm dizzy? I think Let's that's why we're not all dude. falling off of the earth because of the... No, but that's a gravitational thing. That has been spinning. Well, Let's see what's it coming. Oh, okay. Incoming message. Space is hard. Gravity's hard, too. Also, $12,000 TVs are hard on your pocketbook. What does our caller have to say about them? Hello. Regarding your commentary on the cost of 4K displays and who could possibly afford them, 15 years ago I managed at a large retail chain, and we had ten and $12,000 televisions on display at a time when CRT was still king. We all thought, who could afford these? And today we have bigger, better, and smarter TVs under $1,000. In 15 more years, who knows? Maybe one day retina display will be projections into our eyes. Something to think about. Long live the screensavers, TV in Tampa. Aww. Thanks. Uh, yeah, absolutely reasonable. The, these TVs will come down in price. I'm going to just keep my old-fashioned 1080p TV until 8K TVs get, you know, at a reasonable price. 8K for you. Sounds yep. great. We got, we got an email from bust. Ken. <laughs> AK Plus will be better. Okay, so we've got an email from Kevin. He says, yesterday a guest mentioned he was concerned about bandwidth issues regarding delivery of 4K content. Now, I have DirecTV with four set-top boxes capable of recording eight HD shows simultaneously without any problems. However, if I want to stream HD on Netflix over Internet, I sometimes have buffer issue uh, issues. The 4K bandwidth concern appears to be a streaming problem for Netflix, Amazon, etc. It seems to me that it would be in the best interest of cable and satellite providers to push hard for 4K in order to offer something the Internet-based content providers cannot. 
it's a really interesting point, Kevin, the fact that you could have really high quality video without any like bandwidth concern. Kevin has a serious uh, television addiction, it sounds like. I, I don't. I, I, <laughs> Eight he, HD he, shows simultaneously. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Well, he seems to be implying that it's a streaming issue. It's a bandwidth issue. It's, it's not Netflix's fault. If you have a proper amount of bandwidth, Netflix HD will stream just fine without any buffering issues. The, the problem is internet service providers. I, I, and I, I think he still makes a good point, but I don't think it's going to last as long. And in fact, Leo was saying he met with a few streaming providers at CES who told him they're not worried about bandwidth for 4K streaming because there's going to be good compression algorithms that will ease the limit and, and bandwidth is going to continue to, to rise. No matter what the ISPs are saying about caps, et cetera, there is going to be better bandwidth in the future. And so it's, it's not, I, I don't think the future is we're going to continue to need satellite and cable television. In fact, I, I don't even think cable and satellite providers believe that. Got another email from James. We talked earlier on the show about how Phil Schiller said, we're not making a cheaper iPhone. Uh, but James says, I had another thought about that discussion and why Apple might want a plastic cheaper version. When they announce the iPhone 5S or whatever that new model will be, they'll have the iPhone 5, the iPhone 5S, possibly the 4S as the cheapest version. So the question is, why would Apple want to make a new phone instead of the 4S? The 4S would be the last remaining iOS product that still has the old dock connector. If you take away the manufacturing need to replicate the old 30-pin connector, it may make sense to retool for a new version. At least that, along with the other reasons you stated, might be enough to make a cheaper plastic iPhone a reality. Just my thoughts. Love the show. Hmm. I feel you like they could also just start making the 4S with the new connector as well. Well, and I don't think. I don't think. I don't if they're going to do that, though, then it might make sense to to change the materials to make it cheaper. Possibly, I don't know. possibly. He's, he's on to something with the connector issue. I think they'll just wait for that to just decline. Mm -hmm. they, well, they didn't do that with the iPad, right? They just revved it and they just switched out the yeah, connector. So, I mean, that's true. I think, I think it might be on to something. Yeah. Good, good thoughts, James. Well, that is it for this episode of Tech News Today. Thanks to everybody for submitting stories at our subreddit, technewstoday.reddit.com. That's the place where you can go not only to tell us what stories you'd like us uh, to talk about, but also to vote on the stories that other people have submitted. Uh, it's a great place to make your voice heard. We do pay attention to it. That's why we, you know, that Dell story was a couple of days old, but it got buried in all the CES news and it got lots of votes on our subreddit. So that's the kind of thing we want to know about. You can also give us a shot on the web anytime. If you're like, wait a minute, where is the show? What's going on twit.tv slash tnt it links to our show notes and all that sort of stuff so check that out you can email us tnt at twit.tv and give us a call 260 tnt show paul spain joins us from ces tomorrow we'll see you then